What's up guys, Dr. Gooden here with part three of how to program for resistance training. Now all of this information comes from chapter 17 from the textbook, Essentials of Strength Training and Conditioning. And in particular, this video will address training frequency or how often should we train and why. Now, if you missed parts one and two or want to skip ahead to parts four, five, and six, uh, they're all linked down below in the description. But I've also linked them at the end of each video. So if you watch all the way through to the end, you can just click on over to the next part. Okay, guys, let's get right into the material. Now, this comes from chapter 17 of the textbook Essentials of Strength Training and Conditioning, written by Drs. Shepard and Triplett. So, training frequency is the number of training sessions completed in a given period of time. And for a resistance training program, the common time period is typically one week. Now, I've seen other uh, time periods or microcycles, as they're called, used, whether it's 10 days or 14 days, but really one week is by far the most common and the most practical because everything else in an athlete and a coach's life tends to revolve in weekly cycles. Now, the first thing to consider when thinking about training frequency is training status. Now, we, we talked previously in a previous video about how to classify an athlete as a beginner, intermediate, or advanced weight training trainee. And of course, that was just uh, those were just guidelines. They're not hard and fast rules. But in general, we want to have some knowledge of where this athlete falls in their training status. So beginners can get away with training two to three times per week, whereas intermediates can increase that to three to four, and advanced can get away with training maybe even up to seven days per week. And I use the term get away with very specifically because in reality, a beginner could train every day, right? With a body part split where they just hit that muscle group and then they rest that muscle group while they go and hit other muscle groups. So maybe on Monday, they do chest and triceps. And on Tuesday, they do back and biceps. And Wednesday, they do legs. And then they repeat that. And so they've had two days of rest in between training uh, the same muscle group again, right? So you train a muscle group, two days of rest, and then you train it again and you repeat. And that would be six days of training in a week. And as a beginner, you could handle that. But does a beginner need that to make improvements? Probably not. A beginner could probably get away with training full body uh, every time they hit the gym and training just twice a week or three times a week to get slightly faster gains. Now, an advanced trainee, again, they could get away with training seven days a week, but should they, right? Because an advanced trainee will now be lifting much higher absolute loads than when they, he or she started and loads much uh, greater than their own body weight, right? Relative to their own body weight, or at least they should be if they've made any kind of strength gains over their years of training. And so we often see that the biggest and strongest people actually have a slightly lower training frequency than the less strong and, and potentially smaller people. And this is because when they train, they actually do a ton of physiological damage to their bodies. I mean, imagine a you know 240 pound, just absolute beast walking into the gym and loading all the plates onto the bar as he or she is warming up to do back squats. And then they go through a deep set of back squats. They're doing sets of five, right? And it's maybe at 90 to 95% of their relative uh, rep max for fives, a heavy day for them. And if they're squatting 450 or 500 pounds for reps, because this is an advanced, strong trainee, think about the damage that they're doing to their muscles. And they might require a really long time to recover from that. Contrast that with, you know, a, a new trainee who comes in and they can barely squat half their body weight and they just feel like they can squat all day because it maybe they have the uh, capacity, they have the, the work capacity, perhaps it's even an endurance athlete or something, but they just, they just can't cause as much damage as this larger, more advanced trainee. And so this table from the textbook, you know, it's a guideline, but we also need to consider uh, each individual's individualistic recovery timeline when we're considering training frequency. So here's a table showing some uh, some potential training splits that you can use with your athletes or with yourself throughout the week. Now, these are just, just examples, and there are many, many others that would work, um, and they each have their own pros and cons. So the first one uh, is right here. So you see training day one and training day two. So it's an upper-lower split. That's what we would call this, an upper-lower split. So you train lower body, and then you train upper body. Then you rest, and you train lower body again, and you train upper body again and then you rest so four days a week per training but you're really your training frequency is actually really only two days a week per muscle group even though you train four times you're only training your upper body twice and your lower body twice so that's an upper lower training split we also have another um, off used training split so chest shoulders and triceps or your uh, pushing muscles right so horizontal and vertical pressing would use your chest shoulders and triceps and then lower body so legs 
and then your back, trapezius, and biceps, or your pulling muscles. And so we train uh, pushing, and then legs, and then pulling, and then you rest. And then maybe we have some sort of a, and then we go back to chest, uh, shoulders, and triceps, and then lower body. So we don't fully get in um, a full repeat of the cycle. And then next week, we would start back again on back, trapezius, and biceps. Now, I think you can improve on this by just taking out that second rest day so that each week you get uh, two times per muscle group. So push, legs, pull, push, legs, pull, and then rest on Sunday. Now the third example here, now the third example splits it up a little bit uh, more bodybuilding style and, and not even really in a, in a style uh, that I think many people would like because it puts chest and back together, right? So maybe we're doing pushing and pulling movements, uh, but maybe not doing any emphasis for the arms directly. But your arms get plenty of emphasis and stimulus when you're bench pressing and overhead pressing and doing chin-ups and, and dumbbell rows, and then, and then legs, and then shoulders and arms, uh, like a focus day for shoulders and arms where you can really get after, yeah, you know, doing lateral raises and curls and triceps extensions, etc. We probably wouldn't use something like that uh, for many athletes unless they were a bodybuilder. And now there's countless other ways to divide up the training week and to devise your training split. These are just a few examples. Some other ways to divide it up would be to do maybe a strength lift one day and have a rest day and then uh, do more power oriented movements on the third day and then have a rest day. And then um, on that third day of training, if you're in a strength emphasis phase, maybe do another day of strength movements. Or if you're later in the season uh, or during the competition period, then maybe that third day would be more power oriented movements as well. If you're in a strength power phase, now you could emphasize different fitness characteristics that way as well. Now we also need to consider what portion of the season you're in when thinking about training frequency. Now typically for the weight room, we want uh, greater frequency in the off season and then less frequency in season. And this is just because sport practice and competition takes a much higher priority, obviously in season than it does preseason and off season. You're literally building up the athlete in order uh, for that athlete to be able to handle the stress and the rigor of the season. And so greater frequency makes more sense in the off season. And then it just tapers down as we get into the season. Now we also want to consider training load and exercise type. There are some exercises which are just far more taxing than others. And obviously greater loads uh, are more taxing than lighter loads. I would also say though, we want to consider how close this athlete is training to failure. If you're using repetition maximum training where you're, where you're maxing out the number of reps that you lift at a particular load, this style of training requires more recovery between sessions as well. So how close is the athlete to their absolute max when they're training? How close are they to their repetition max when they're training? Um, and what types of exercises uh, are they using? Do they incur high amounts of central nervous system stress? Do they incur high amounts of joint stress? Um, is, there, is there a lot of neural fatigue from the way they train? And if so, then we might want to decrease training frequency. So for instance, uh, things like heavy full cleans can uh, really take a toll on the body or heavy deadlifts or doing a ton of ballistic sort of plyometric work can impact the joints negatively in a way that you have to recover for longer, especially if you have athletes with larger body size, like maybe you're training football athletes and they do a plyometric session. Those athletes are encountering much higher forces than if you put you know, your women's soccer team through a plyometric uh, routine. And so that women's soccer team might recover much faster than, those, than the linebackers on your football team. And finally, something that you can't forget to consider is the overall amount of physical stress imposed not just by what you're doing in the weight room, but by the athlete's sport practice, by their uh, film sessions, by the classes that they have, uh, by the other life stressors that they're encountering. Maybe uh, it's finals week and you're a collegiate strength and conditioning coach and you're wondering, oh, why are my athletes numbers tanking? Well, it's because all their professors just slammed them with huge finals and they're studying and cramming for them and you know, staying up late, or, you know, maybe your athlete just had some sort of relational drama and he or she is not focusing in the weight room and, you know, they're not able to train again and not recovering as quickly because of this extra stress in their life. So we have to consider all of the outside stressors, or as Dr. Stone always used to say, outside stressors uh, when we're considering uh, training frequency. All right, guys, now after you have determined training frequency, the next thing to consider is exercise order. And so I have a video talking about that, uh, which you can click on over to to continue learning how to program for resistance training. Now, if you have any questions about this video, let me know down in the comments. Otherwise, I'll see you guys on the next video.